Welcome to Dunway Baptist Church. Our reading this morning is from Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Read the whole story. We read the first half of it some weeks back, but we'll read it all this morning so you get the whole thing. And those of you who've just listened to the uh, young people's message, children's talk, um, see how it follows through from what you've just heard. So Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, then the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, and all the peoples, nations, languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever! You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready... When you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. And they were thrown into the fire, burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? 
They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. That can also be read like the son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counsellors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. Their hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's pray. Mighty God and loving Heavenly Father, Thank you for that reading from your word. Thank you, Lord, that these things are written for us to learn from. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to learn this morning. Help us to set aside all the distractions. Set aside all the preconceived ideas that we may have about what these things mean and to listen to your voice and to hear your voice guiding us, teaching us, applying these things. Lord, we all have different circumstances, different characters, different situations to deal with. Help us, Lord, that we each one may in our own way stand firm to the glory of your name and as a blessing to all who observe us. Lord, give us wisdom, give us courage and help us to know and love you and to serve you truly. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to be here this morning. Many people we observe are unable to be here and we pray for them wherever they may be. And Lord, we thank you that even if we can't be here in person, there is the ability to watch on the internet and we thank you for that. Thank you that over these last weeks, months, year and a half, there's been so much contact through the internet. Lord, it is such a blessing. But thank you that we don't need the internet to draw near to you. For you are with us wherever we are. You hear our prayers whenever we pray. You have said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And Lord, we thank you for your presence. and Pray that we may really be blessed today. And Lord, we have particular things that we need your help with. Some have health problems. Some have difficulties at work. Some have relationship difficulties. Some of us, Lord, have problems which the rest of us can't even guess at. But you know all the details. And we think particularly, Lord, today of those who mourn. We pray for our Queen and the Royal Household. And we pray for all who mourn for the loss of the Duke of Edinburgh. Lord, it is a sad time. But thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came to give hope that those who die trusting in him will rise again to eternal and joyous life. And we pray, Lord, that this blessing may occupy the hearts and minds of those who mourn, that they may consider their own ways and be wise. Lord, help us each one to know and love and serve you. But we pray that as a God of comfort, you will draw near 
and help. And we pray, Lord, for those who suffer because they serve you. Those who, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, cast into a burning, fiery furnace, it may not be a literal furnace, but their lives are disrupted. Their liberty is taken. Lord, we pray your blessing upon your persecuted children. Help them to have the joy of the Lord in their hearts, that they may stand firm and be an excellent testimony to truth that those who walk in darkness and persecute those who walk in the light may see the light for themselves and turn and follow you. So speak to us today, Lord. You know our needs. Minister to us that we may serve you. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. So I want to look this morning at Daniel chapter 3. The subject is security and comfort in times of trial. And our text is verse 27 of Daniel 3. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counsellors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and the smell of fire, no smell of fire had come upon them. No smell, even. Not a whiff. No power over them at all. Now, as we noted when we looked at the uh, first half of this story some weeks ago, back before Easter, this ridiculous image which Nebuchadnezzar pushed up on the plain of Dura. It doesn't say in the Bible what the image was, but some people have suggested it was actually an image of himself. Obviously, he must have been a fairly short man if he thought a really long, thin pole with his face on it was going to compensate for something. But anyway, it was, a, it was rubbish. The arbitrary demand to worship this heap of gold standing in a pile, however beautiful or ugly it may have been, it is just ridiculous. And it's so much like the politically correct idols that the liberal elite force upon us today. Everybody's supposed to bow to these stupid ideas that everyone can see are oh, stupid, but nobody dares mention it, because if you do, you get roasted in the fire of the popular press, or worse. You know, it's that kind of picture. The idols are nonsense. Some of them are clearly anti-Christian. Some of them are just stupid. But either way, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Christians sometimes find themselves being spied upon. Therefore, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They knew full well that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego would not bow to this stupid idol. But when people gather round, you know, when, them, when you're standing in a crowd and the whole crowd gathers round and says, you're not going to do it, are you? It's really quite tempting to just nod in the direction of the idol and move on. Just to wave a hand at it or something. Just, just, just to give a little direction in the a little nod in the direction of political correctness for the sake of peace and quiet. It's quick, it's easy, and it's really tempting, and it really shouldn't be done. Well, sin shouldn't be done. I'm not trying to say everything that's politically correct is sin, but you get the picture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going to worship this idol. Everybody knew it, so everybody was watching to see if they did. And there must have been a very strong temptation, as I say, to give way. So we are deeply indebted to these three brave men that they didn't do it. They stood firm. And the whole story here is written for us. Same as it was written for the people at the time, we see the whole event, the initial trial, the final outcome. It really happened. It's a bit of history. But it's here as a picture for us 
to learn from. It's a picture of the spiritual reality that God's people face over and over and over again. Most of us don't face it in the glare of publicity so that anyone else even notices. But there are times when we are tempted and we have to stand firm. And that's our subject. Security and comfort in times of trial. Everything around us, everyone around us says, oh, just give way, it's quicker. But we need to be sure we're not just being pig-headed, narrow-minded, traditional. We need to have the security of knowing that we're doing the right thing and the comfort that whatever happens as a consequence doesn't matter. So, our text the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counsellors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hairs of their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, no smell of fire had come upon them. They came off better than me doing the barbecue. Just didn't affect them. So let's have a look at that and security. Comfort and blessing. Security is obviously the opposite of insecurity. Well, insecurity is the opposite of security, whichever it is. It's a really sad fact. A fact which is so obvious and so sad, it's surprising people don't get embarrassed when they find themselves proving it, that those who set up idols like Nebuchadnezzar, like the political elite of the world, like the pressure groups, they are insecure. They need people to affirm their ideas or they feel they're being got at. They don't know that they're right. If your life is based upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you're founded on the rock of God's word, you know the truth. You don't need anyone to agree with you, you just know. But these poor people are insecure. They desperately need people to affirm their ideas, to agree with their standards. They feel vulnerable if anyone dares to disagree with them. And because they feel vulnerable, they get violent. Hence persecution. As I say, Jesus said in John 8, 31, 32, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Set you free from the need to be affirmed by other people. Set you free from the worry that you might be wrong. Because if you agree with God, it really doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. The total security of knowing the truth. Even if you can't prove it, you just know it. It's a gift. God's gift, faith. That doesn't mean you're not afraid when everyone's ganging up on you. That doesn't mean you don't tremble at the thought of what might happen. But you haven't really got any answer. And, and you can't change what you say. You know, so somebody brings you a cup of water and says, dip your finger into it. Is it wet or is it dry? You know it's wet. Everyone can see it's wet. Everyone would know you'd be telling a barefaced lie if you said it wasn't. So you haven't got any choice. You know the truth. The truth has delivered you from any choice. It's wet. And when people come and ask you a question about God or about something that's right or wrong, God's word says, you don't have any question. You may be very afraid of telling the truth, but you haven't got any option because you know the right answer. Solid facts. But, as I say, it doesn't give you any liberty from being afraid. So security of knowing the truth is one thing, but there's also the security of knowing who's in charge. It's threats and bluster gave the impression that Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. If you don't do this, I'll do that and you'll suffer. 
I'm in charge. Nebuchadnezzar, me. He was desperate to prove it. He was desperate to keep his position. If Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego ignored his image and everyone knew that they were ignoring it and he did nothing, he was going to lose face big time and he couldn't stand it. Everyone was going to laugh at his stupid idea. The whole power base would start to crumble. So verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. The expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. That was clever of him. But, you know, these were some of his wisest counsellors. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were the brightest bunch in the kingdom. And they were disagreeing with him. He just couldn't let that happen. He was filled with fury. He required, in his view, to be top dog everywhere. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, well, they'd read their Bible. They knew way back Jeremiah had said that Nebuchadnezzar was going to rule the world before Nebuchadnezzar had even been thought of. And, yeah, here he was ruling the world. Why? Because God said he was. So who's in charge? God is. Who said don't worship idols? God did. Their duty was to serve God. They knew who was in charge. And if you're going to serve God, you serve the king. And if you're one of the king's brightest counsellors, how do you serve the king best? By telling him the truth. You know, if <laughs> there is zero point in having people to advise you who don't tell you the truth. That's the whole point of wise counsellors. They tell you the truth. And the king was doing the wrong thing. The new law about worshipping this silly lamb of gold was wrong. The king was usurping God's authority and contradicting God's word. Now think about it. Nebuchadnezzar had been given the job of being king of kings, lord of lords, ruler of the whole world, as everybody knew at the time. He was the head of gold and the image of gold and all the rest of it. He was a great, great man. God had given him a great job. And he was abusing his position. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had been given the job of being counsellors to the king. God had given them that job. And they were determined not to abuse their position. God had put them there to tell the king the truth, and the king, truth was what they were going to tell him. God was in control, and it was God they were serving, so they had complete security for the situation and the stand that they were taking. It wasn't rebellious, it wasn't defiant, it wasn't uncertain, it wasn't uh, political. It was just fact. I serve God. God says tell the truth. The truth is this. End of story. Which is a great comfort. Second point. Now, these were godly young men. So I expect they had read Isaiah. Now, Isaiah, if you don't know, was a prophet who was, well, he wrote an awful lot of the Bible in the middle of it, a prophecy of Isaiah, but he lived and prophesied during the reign of Hezekiah. And um, he died probably in the reign of Manasseh. So he was fairly recent history as far as these men were concerned. But Isaiah had predicted that Jerusalem would be destroyed and taken into captivity by Babylon. And in Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 to 7, Isaiah says to Hezekiah, the king at the time, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, I don't know whether Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were eunuchs. Nobody's told us that. 
But the point is, they were of the royal house of Israel. They were of the nobility. So they fit this prophecy perfectly. Here they were in Babylon, just as Isaiah had said years before Babylon was even informed. So they knew where they were and they knew why they were there. And so they could also take comfort from Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. It's always a great blessing to know the scripture. And verse 17 indicates that they probably did. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Now, they were probably humble uh, and didn't presume that they were to be privileged to have a literal fulfillment of the words of the prophecy. After all, it's a fact, most people who are burned for their faith are physically consumed by the fire. But the reality of God's presence is a fact. And the reality that they will not be spiritually harmed is a fact. The calm security that those realities give is evident. You read the history, if you wish, of um, many of the martyrs who were burned at the stake or whatever. They're calm, they're kind, they're loving towards those who are lighting the fire. How can that be? Because they have perfect peace and security. Peace that passes understanding, keeping their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had a calm serenity here. And also, remember the other pictures that turn up in Scripture quite frequently about God's people. God's people are gold, silver. And you put gold and silver into a furnace and the impurities are burned away, but the gold and the silver are not harmed. We are not damaged by trial. So whatever trial God causes us to endure physically, we know spiritually it's not doing us any harm at all. It's doing us good. It's making us more like Jesus. You know those comforting words in Romans 8, 28, 29. I always put 29 with it. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that conforming to the image of his son, that may take quite a few goes in the furnace before we are quite purified. It all works together for our good. So for us, for God's people at the time, for God's people in all ages, this piece of history literally gives us a physical demonstration of a spiritual fact. God's with us in the fire. Whatever the fire may be, God is with us and it will not harm us. And so we see verse 25, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods, a son of the gods. That, as I say, can be translated the son of God. So, great comfort, great blessing. But also, in going through this trial, standing firm as they did, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are a great blessing to others. And every one of God's people who stands firm is a great blessing and encouragement to others. If you don't kind of get that, just think how terribly disheartening and upsetting it is when God's people give way under trial. So that's the third point, blessing. Love your enemies, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And if Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had hated Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in general, the best thing they could have done would be to bow to their idol. 
to encourage them in their evil. But because they loved them, they didn't. Love for God and love for your enemies means telling the truth about God. It's not love to encourage somebody to continue to do something which is going to damn them for eternity. No, it's not loving to let children play with really sharp knives or live wires or fireworks and matches. That's not love. That is hatred. You want them to destroy themselves. And so, lovingly, Shadrach and Amish, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were a blessing. A blessing to God's people, <coughs> such an encouragement to everybody else, and a blessing to their enemies, because they knew the truth. And so, verse 28, 29, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, and language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and the houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. You've got to love Nebuchadnezzar, haven't you? He, he really goes whole hog either way. You worship his wretched idol, or now you're going to worship the Lord. And he puts a threat on both sides. But you know, he really takes it. A few moments ago, he was scared silly that his leadership was going to be undermined because somebody wasn't bound to his idol. Now he is utterly convinced. And he just brushes aside people not bowing to his idol and rejoices in the revelation of God. We'll, we'll look more at Nebuchadnezzar later on as we go through Daniel's um, book. But, you know, it's a great thing. God rewarded the faithfulness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He used their testimony. And it brought blessing to the king, to all the counsellors, to all the people, and, of course, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, too. They were promoted in the province of Babylon. God always rewards faithfulness. It's a fact. Same as he always punishes sin. This piece of history lays out in physical terms the spiritual blessing that always occurs. Whether or not anybody takes any notice of it. The enemies of God, the enemies of his church, are forced to acknowledge the power of God supporting his faithful servants. Whenever we stand firm against the world, the world has to admit God is helping us. Because humanly speaking, you wouldn't do it. Which is why, of course, the world is so dead scared of prayer and church and godly people in general, because God is with them. So, when these things happen, when we stand firm, God is encouraged, uh, sorry, God's people are encouraged, and God's enemies are warned, and as in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, come to a better understanding of truth. And through the trial, only good things remain. Only good things remain in the lives of those who suffer. What was destroyed in the furnace? Their coats weren't, their hats weren't, their hairs weren't, their bodies weren't. What, what did burn? Of all the things that went into the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, what got burnt? Only one thing. That was the ropes that tied them. Nothing else did. They were liberated. Verse 24. Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? But I see four men unbound. There was nothing else burned except the bindings. It was a liberating event in their life. Now, had they died in the furnace, that would have been liberating, as the Apostle Paul says, to depart and be with Christ is far better. 
eternal joy and liberty. But for those who do not physically die under whatever trial it is they've got, freedom is increased. We understand better how the Lord is able to support us and encourage us. Now, one of the things that the world worries about is trauma and stress. And it is horrible stuff. The lasting damage that trauma and stress do to people is, is it's terrible. And, of course, the devil and his agents in many countries seek deliberately to traumatise people, to cause stress, to break people down mentally. And that, of course, is something which is used a lot against the church. There are correction facilities in some countries where Christians are sent to be brainwashed. Sadly, physically, they may succeed. But, look at verse 27. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, there was no smell of fire upon them. The experience that these three men went through should have had lasting effects. It did have lasting effects. They were promoted. People saw the uh, witness uh, and were blessed. But there was nothing negative, not even a smell of it. And this is something we need to be really careful of. You know, sometimes the Lord sends us through a trial and we come out the other side bitter. Oh, if you knew what I'd suffered. No. If we are suffering with the Lord and the Lord is with us, we come out the other side rejoicing. There should be no testimony of what I've suffered for Christ. The testimony should be what Christ has suffered for us and how he has supported us and used all things together for our good. Now, some Christians go around with a long face. <coughs> And they talk about their sufferings and they talk about their trials and they talk about their traumas. Well, physically they may be pretty knocked up by things, yes. But spiritually, no. Shouldn't be like that. And when people come along to a real Christian, talking real Christian here, and they tell them about their real troubles, and they hear, I can't smell anything. What are you talking about? You know, there is no spiritual damage. There is growth. If we are feeling traumatized by our sufferings, that's because we're feeling self-piteous. That's sin. That's something to be confessed and moved on from. Nothing negative comes from God's hand. All things work together for good. So if we've got trials and troubles in our situation which are making us bitter against God, we need to consider carefully how we're tackling things. Do we have the security of truth? Or were we just doing it because it disagreed with our political situation? You know, some people get very political. Even Christians have political opinions. Ask my family about it sometimes. Uh, you know, we, we may... We may stand, make a testimony, for the wrong reason. We stand for God's truth. Trusting God to save us from hell for eternity. We can trust him to save us from however long the trials of this life take, because it's no time at all compared to eternity. Trust him. We are secure. We know the truth. God is with us. Rejoice in it. And we know that as we stand with him for truth, his truth, not our truth, his truth, it will be a blessing to us, to his people, and also to our enemies, because it's shining as a light in the darkness. 
May God help us. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, in some ways very simple, in other ways very profound. But the individual application to each of us, Lord, is just that, individual. Because we all have different characters, different situations, different opportunities. But the same God, same truth, same promise. Lord, help us to hear your voice prompting us and helping us in our situation that we each one may glorify you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.